Good morning, good morning, everybody. Beautiful day in uh, Comanche County this morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Visitors, if you are here and you have kiddos, um, right before the lesson, they'll be, let, they'll be showing where to go. And I've got some great programs over there for those kiddos. Right now, we're going to continue singing to our amazing God. Majesty, worship His majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, power, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from His throne. Christ my 
king. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Up to the hill of Calvary, my Savior. of the wine so usually for the bread I thank Jesus for everything that he did and is still doing on the earth and then for the wine I thank Jesus for preparing us a place in heaven before his resurrection Jesus performed a lot of miracles here on earth some were so seamless that you just had to touch the edge of his clothing and then you were healed he didn't even have to be on the same street Jesus just said believe and then a little girl was brought back from the dead. So right now, uh, Corinthians 11, verse 23 and 24, Jesus takes the bread and says, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, I'd like to thank Jesus for all the things he's done so seamlessly in our lives that we don't even notice them. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you so much for every accident that didn't happen. Thank you for every time the fuel in the tank lasted just long enough to reach the gas station. Thank you for easing the pain of this world to an amount that we can handle. 
giving us reasons to smile even when things are tough. How beautiful the sunset always is even when we aren't looking. Every big and small miracle here on earth, it's in your name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As the Apostles' Creed says, when Jesus descended into hell, he went to the abode of the dead to release the just souls who needed him to open the gates of heaven for them. Jesus' resurrection ensured that any who believe in him, accept him as the Son of God, and are baptized in his name, will be covered in his blood, so that when we reach judgment, God will see his sacrifice washing away our sins. I like to even just try and picture that. Jesus isn't just offering paradise to everyone in this room, not even everyone on the planet. Jesus' resurrection offered redemption to everything that is, was, or will be, covering the planet multiple times over. That is a scale of hundreds of billions. I can't even picture that. I don't think anyone could be thankful enough for a sacrifice like that. Corinthians then continues in verse 25, saying, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. At this time, let us take the cup and remember the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. God, thank you so much for dying on the cross for our sins so that we may spend eternity with you in heaven. And thank you, Jesus, for raising from the dead and proving that you are the one true God who stands above all things, even death. We cannot wait to spend eternity with you. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. It is also at this time that we do contributions and donations. If God has laid it on your heart, then you can leave those in the main area by where you got the communion cups. It is also at this time that we pray for that. God, thank you for the abundance of blessings in our lives. Whatever we give to you, Lord, be it money, our music, or prayer, or our time, let it be given with a cheerful heart and a giving spirit, and that it's used in a matter that pleases you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In moments like these, Where the 
the soul of man never dies. Those times there'll be no sadness, no tea, no tear, dim dies. Where all this peace is joy and love, and the soul of man never dies. A love light beams across the foam, where the soul of man never dies. It shines to light the shores of home, where the soul of man never dies. No sense there'll be, no sadness, no tea, no tear dim dies. Where all these peace and joy and love, and the soul of man never dies. I'm on my way to that fair land where the soul of man never dies. Where there will be no parting hand and the soul of man never dies. No sense there'll be no sad farewells, no tea, no tear dim dies. Where all these pieces dry and up and the soul And the church said? Amen. Amen. Is fall break just about to end or is it about to start? It's about to start. I knew it was one or the other, but fall break. I thought you just started school like last week or something. I know the teachers love those fall breaks. You know, someone asked me a while back, do you ever get any offers to leave this church? I said, oh, you bet I do. I've had at least 50 offers to leave this church, and when I get one from the outside of the church, I'm taking it. <laughs> Just kidding. 31 years. But I can promise you that I'm not going to stay another 31. Donna said we have to retire at some point, and I don't want to be, what would that be, 90, a whole long time from now. There's an ant... It's called the Allegheny ants. Don't really know, I don't research a lot of the Allegheny ants, but nonetheless, they, they help in the forest, they say. In fact, they help move uh, the soil from below the earth to the surface. One colony of ants in the forest was looked at and studied for a period of three years. And in that three year period of time, that one colony of ants moved 15 tons of soil to the surface. The scripture tells us there is go to the ant, consider her ways, and then be wise. That's an interesting verse. But I believe that if God can use a bunch of ants to move tons of earth, he can certainly use you and me. Mickey Mantle. You know, it's baseball, I call it baseball season because I don't ever think that it starts until really the playoffs and then the World Series. It's kind of how I look at it. Mickey Mantle, he's a name, of course, that if you ever followed baseball, it goes down in the history books, great Hall of Famer, and so on and so forth. But you see, Mickey Mantle had a big problem. He was an alcoholic, a severe alcoholic. And because of that, he said in a news conference once, he had squandered the gift of life and warned all admirers that he was no role model at all. He even went on to say, God gave me the ability to play baseball. For in fact, he said, God has given me everything. And he said to the kids out there, don't be like me. So I asked the question today, what is it that God has given you to do? What is it that God has given you to do? And I think more importantly, do you want anyone to follow your footsteps? I think that causes us a reality check in our lives, or at least it should. Because the truth is, as Christians, we all know that we are to use the gifts that God has given us for His glory. And we are to be the role models for those around us. 
But maybe perhaps you're the person that feels as wondered in your life because many people do. Things of the past that's haunted you, hurt you, people that have hurt you or you've hurt yourself and decisions that you've made or whatever it might be. You just feel that person all the time that you're this person that always looks on the negative side of things and you might think to yourself, can God really use someone like me? Well, I want to tell you today, of course, the answer is yes. God can. The question is, will you let him? Do you desire to be used by God? And so, what I want to do today is I want to give you a few things that you can put in your shirt pocket and take home with you. Because if you really want to be used by God, there are some things that can trigger it's not that you trigger God, but it's you, you realize who God is in your life. Because these are the things that God looks at and he sees you and I as his followers desiring in our lives. And so hopefully that will be a help to you. Fall breaks, Christmas breaks, spring breaks, and even summers off. God uses people, first of all, who realize that they are weak in and of themselves. And this is important to understand as Christians, that we are weak, but he is strong. And that I may not be able to do it, but I know that God can do all things. Now, if I believe that in my spirit, then I have to adjust so that I might be able to get the strength that he says is available in him for my life. And the way that strength comes is through humility. Humility. It is in that humility that he lifts us up. It's the key to the strength that God offers you today. Warren Wiersbe said it well when he said, you can never be too small for God to use, only too big. You get too big for our britches, we think we're the ones running the show. We think I can do this on my own, thank you very much. But when you fully understand that you can't, but that he can, when you fully understand that, you then become the leader that God has called you to be, and you will look behind you and you will find people following because you know that God has given you the strength to lead. There are many people throughout history that I look at and I look to, and I love to look at pieces of history of those that made a difference. George Washington Carver is one of those men. I don't know if you teach that in school anymore or not. I, I can't, I could, I, if you don't, I can't understand why. Maybe I do understand why, but I think it's sad. George Washington Carver was a Christian man, but he was a scientist who developed hundreds. In fact, I think the book I have says over 1,200 products from the simple thing called a peanut. Imagine that. When he was a young boy, this is what he, in one of his writings he says, and I just love this, because it, it reminds me of where I need to be. He says, when I was a young boy, I said to God, God, tell me the mystery of the universe. And God simply answered and said, that knowledge is revealed and reserved for me and me alone. So I then asked God, tell me the mystery of the peanut. Then God said, well, George, that's more nearly your size. And he told me. And boy, howdy, did he tell him. In fact, if you look at history there, probably the peanut and the potatoes saved the South in a period of time. It's an amazing story if you don't know it. If your kids, just ask your kids if they know it. If they don't, study it together. It's a fun read. And it's a blessing, I promise you. In Joshua chapter 1, Phil Kennedy stood up here last week and read this as we closed our service last week. And it kind of stirred that in me again this week as well. In Joshua 1, the scripture says that God tells Joshua something. He says, do not be terrified or afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do you know that God is with you wherever you go? It's, it's, it's pretty weak, but do you know that God is with you wherever you go? Amen. You can't just put God on a shelf and say, you stay here and I'll pick you up on uh, Sunday morning about 9 o'clock. 
Now, some try to do that, but God knows all things. He knows what you're thinking right now. And so he tells him that. So God told Joshua to be strong and courageous three times in four scriptures. And it's, it's pretty amazing, and I often wonder, why did he have to tell him three times? Did he have a hearing problem? No. I think that he probably knew that Joshua would be afraid. And so he tells him to be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Oh, be very strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. So he tells him that. Understandably so, because you see, Moses was the leader. Moses followed God, and Joshua followed Moses, which was following God. In return, there was his mentor. But now Moses is taken out of the picture, and so Joshua is now appointed the leader. And now God raises up Joshua to lead the people of Israel. And he hardly felt adequate for the task, the job at hand. But I want to tell you, because we can talk about Joshua, we can talk about the other people in Scripture but I want to talk to you today about that. I want you to know that if God calls you, God will enable you. God wants to call you into his kingdom, but then he enables you to be able to do what he wants you to do. And when you humble yourself before the Lord, he will show you precisely what that is that he wants you to do. And you will know then that you will have the strength that you think you thought you never would have to be able to accomplish great things in the kingdom of God. You see, God doesn't save us to sit in pews. God saves us to go into the world. And to go into the world, we have to be prepared and to be prepared, we have to humble ourselves because in and of yourselves, you cannot face the world on its own. It will devour you or it will sway you. But if you humble yourself before the Lord, He will keep you strong and healthy so that you might be able to live in the world and do something with living there for Him. So a key here is being aware to not be afraid, but to be strong in the Lord, knowing that we can't do it without his presence within us. God knew that, so, and Jesus tells us that because Jesus said to his disciples, because they couldn't understand. They thought the kingdom was going to be set up here on earth. But when Jesus said, I'm going to the Father, they couldn't understand, oh, no, we want you to stay. And Jesus says, no, it's not that I should stay. It is better that I should leave. But why? We want you here with us. And Jesus comes back and says, this is why. Because God is going to send his Holy Spirit to live with inside of you. And every born-again Christian has the DNA of God. And therefore, we have the strength within us we just have to humble our hearts and that strength will come to the surface. Give me an amen. amen. It isn't a bad thing to, uh, to discover that you are weak. It's not a bad thing at all. In fact, it's quite good according to Scripture. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will pick you up. The Scripture says there in Matthew 23, For whoever exalts himself, exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. He's telling you there and me there. He's telling us there's an easy way and there's a hard way. There's a your way and there's a God way. And let me tell you, your way is not God's way. And God's way is always the best way. Give me an amen. amen. Humility. In the world's view is a sign of weakness. And that's what they want to continue to tell you. Humility in the sight of God is a sign that you are trusting Him. More than what you're trusting what others might even say. C.S. Lewis has this quote, Until you have given up yourself to him, God, you will not have a real self. So humbling yourself before God is a sure way to be used by God. Now God uses people also who study and live by his written word. If you don't know the word of God, if you don't know the word of God, you can't live it in your life. You'll guess you might get right sometimes, but you don't have to guess in life. You can know where it's at because it's in God's Word. Give me an amen. amen. The study of God's Word for the Christian 
is not so that you know everything because you never will. The study of the Word of God to apply it to your life is important so that you can apply it at the right moments in your life. So that when you go through things in life, you're raising children and it's a struggle for you, you know where to go to. You go to the Word of God. You struggle in your marriage, well, you know where to go to. It's in, your, it's in the Word of God. You struggle in your workplace, you struggle with relationships. It's all in the Word of God that will help you work through those things to give you the strength to be used by God in a powerful way. But if you don't know it, you'll let the world tell you what is right and what is wrong. And boy, how they do we listen to the world too much. But the application that used of God's word pays great dividends in your life. If you, if you have no investment, you have no return. But if you have great investment, you have greater return from God. Listen to this translation from James chapter 1. And now some don't like to use other translations. And you can read from the King James if you choose. This doesn't change salvation. But I like the way it says it. Obey God's message. I like that exclamation point. He says, don't fool yourself by listening to it. If you hear the message and don't obey it, you are like people who stare at themselves in the mirror and forget what they look like as soon as they leave. For those of my age, those my age and a little older, the Fonz, remember? All right. And the others are going, who's that? But anyway. But you must never stop looking at the perfect law that sets you free. God will bless you in everything you do if you listen and obey and don't just hear and forget. There's two sides of the coin there. You can hear it and forget about it. Forget about it. Or you can listen to it and obey it. Now that's entirely left up to you, the individual. And so God says, here if you listen and you obey it, if you hear it and you don't forget it, there will be blessing in your life. Now, answer this question. Who likes blessings in your life? You're supposed to say, I do. Oh, that's good. I like blessings. And God shows us a way to be blessed and also to be used by him for his glory. So God tells Joshua, he continued on that reading that we read last week or Phil did. He says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate it on it day and night. And it goes on to say, when you're sitting at the table and when you're walking down the street, wherever you go, you talk about the Word of God. When you take the kids to school, when you pick them up from practice, you're on your trips or wherever you're going, find some way, somehow, to make sure that you plug God into the picture. Because it's a blessing for their life, but it's a blessing for yours as well. So if you want to be used by God, you need to know the Word of God. Now the word meditate there is a powerful word as we know. Because what you meditate on is what you become or what you act out or you are. And so when you meditate, it means to ponder something. It means to take in deep consideration. It, it means, in my terms, it would be to absorb something in your life. And actually, it means to bathe in it. If you bathe in something that smells good, you smell good. And there's nothing greater than the Word of God to make you smell good in a stinky world. Now, when you're applying, <laughs> knowing that the Word of God will help you, know when it's your turn to step up, to step in. You see, a lot of times people feel like, well, I'm not being you, so therefore I must eh, just forget it. I'll just, I'm not going to be a part of much. Well, I use this about every year, about this time, some way. When you're a player on a team and you're not a starter, we had star quarterback in here. But there's a lot of people on the team that are not starters. But if you're not a starter on the team, you have to practice just as hard, if not harder, than the starters so that when you're called upon, you will be able to step in and not too much is lost there. Unless you're OU. But anyway, that looked pretty bad yesterday. So, but, but in that process, I, but I say that is because if I'm not a starter and 
Coach Manning over here says, Harley, get in the game. Come on, it's your, get in there. And I'm like, who, me? Yeah, you, Harley, get in the game. And I say to, to Brett, I say, hey, Coach, just a minute. i got to go back to the locker room to get my helmet. What do you think he's going to say? Okay, time out. Okay, we're waiting on Harley. No, I don't think so. You forgot your helmet? What did you mean you forgot your helmet? That simply meant to the coach, you're not wanting to play, and you're not ready to play. So you just stay on the bench. But I want to be the person in my Christian walk. I want to be the one when the coach calls upon me, which is not Brett, by the way, when God calls on me, I want to say, here I am, coach, put me in. I'm ready to play. Listen, I have hit home runs in baseball to win games. And it felt good. But in a championship game, I was the last person up, and I struck out, and it don't feel good. But there's one thing for sure I can tell you. I didn't leave the bat on my shoulder. And you players out there know what I mean. you got to get in there when you're called to. You may strike out, but God will still lift you up. You may have failed at something in the past, but God says, you're okay, get back in there. Get hit again. Sometimes you got to get hit a few times to realize you don't like to get hit, meaning you can move to one side or the other. And it's in, I think it's valuable for our lives. Don't mean to get too loud. Bill Henson was telling me the other day, man, sometimes you get real loud up there. I said, okay, I'll keep it down this week. Get loud. Study his word and live by it, and then it comes, when it comes time, you'll know what to do. And here's the great thing. You will have success. It'll come because you've humbled yourself before the Lord and you've studied the word and now you're ready to take action. God is good. God uses the person next who is patient and waits on his timing. We talked about patience just a few weeks ago. And, but I want to take a little twist on it again. Another roundabout, if you will. You remember when the Israelites had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Now, this wasn't a 40-day wander. It's a Listen, 21 days, it was a 21-day journey. They didn't wander for 40 days, 40 months, but 40 years. Imagine that. But in that wandering around in the desert, something had to happen. And they, it had to happen because God was angry with his people because they did not, remember what we said, you can't just hear it and forget it you got to obey it. And they didn't obey it. And God said, fine. So in that 40 years, a lot of people had to die. But all the rest, guess what they had to do? They had to be very patient. God's plan, God's timing, God's blessing. You get that out of order, it will not work in your life. I know I've tried it, and I've tried it again, and I've tried it again, and a few other times and it never has worked because God says it won't work. When you think it's God's timing and it's not God's timing, you're not going to get God's blessing. But when it's God's timing and you move in God's timing, you will get God's blessing. Amen. Imagine wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. We can't. We can't do that. 40 years wandering around. Wandering simply meant going around in circles. Just going around in circles. Go out to Cash, come back to Lawton. Go up to Elgin, come back to Lawton. Forty years of that. We're passing a tree here. I can only imagine we're passing a tree. And I tell my beautiful bride, Donna, I said, Oh, look here. You remember? Look, look at that. That carving up there on the tree. Look how much it's grown. It used to be down here. Harley loves Donna. And we're just at the same tree. I wonder how long it's going to take for us to get to the promised land. These shoes never wear out, though. They look pretty good on me. It's amazing, isn't it? Forty years they wandered, but here is the clincher, or the, the great part. God, God was teaching them something, but he wants to teach us in the same manner. And so he comes in because there's a day when he calls you. 
Because here, he comes in, and the next verse you put up there is, he passed through the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions, prepare provisions. Why? Because within three days you will cross over into the Jordan to go to the, and possess the land. You see, my friend, what we need to do is we need to learn to wait on God's timing. But we do not need to procrastinate when he calls us to move. And that is a big key in your life. It's learning to move correctly and lose out uh, and not lose out on what God wants to accomplish in our lives. Let me brag a little bit on the church here. I've been here with you 31 years. We, and we talk about giving. We talk about the blessings that comes through giving from God. Now we all believe that, do we not? All our blessings come from God. Who says amen to that? All of them. You may say, no, I went to school, I got the degree, I did this and I, yes, all that, but God gave you the ability to do that. And so we know that. And so, so what I'm saying, our hearts were prepared. That's that preparation part. You're, you're prepared for it. And so throughout all those years, you have been so gracious in your tithes and your offerings. It's been remarkable. And I just personally want to thank all of you for what you give. Because whatever you give, it's that dollar or thousands of dollars, it makes a difference. So what, what do I, why do I say that? Why do I bring that to the picture today? Because of this. Last week. Now our hearts are prepared for. Because you're so giving in all the things that we do. All the little programs that we put out. The diaper things that we do. The, 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 the fall fest thing that we do. We do the backpacks, the blessings. Uh, all the things that we're a part of. And missions. And all of those wonderful things. And so last week the elders stood up here and said, you know, with all the terrible hurricanes that have happened, and all the devastation out there, they simply said, we want, we're going to put in a $500 seed right here. And if any of you would like to, above, beyond what your tithe or your offering might be, whatever God places on your heart, there's a basket, or you can go online, and you can contribute to that. Now, we're not a big church, but we are a giving church. And just in a matter of a few short, I mean a small short period of time. And on, I believe it was Wednesday, we were pleased to send 11,000, I think, what was it, Dean? 40, 11, 11, $11,090 to the relief for that. Praise God. Amen. Now, now, let me tell you, that applaud is for God. And it's okay to applaud God. Because you discovered in your heart what God has done for you. And you may have gone without that steak and you went to, well, I was going to say McDonald's, but it cost the same. You, you stayed home and ate ramen noodles that day. And you said, I made a sacrifice because, you know what, that could be me. And Jesus says, a cup of cold water given in my name will not go unnoticed. God notices what we do. And I want you to know that we, the leadership, me just a preacher, but the leadership notices what you do. And we all thank you from our hearts to make a difference. Could we do more? Yes. Have we done something? Yes. Others will do greater things. Some have already gone there. Some have been a part of that. Ernie here, he's already gone there and taken loads of stuff over there. Some of you other have mentioned about doing that and going and being a part of that. What a wonderful blessing to be a part of something that makes a difference in the time in which God said, it's time for you to step up. Time for you to get in the game. And you showed up. And the victory is Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. Joseph Stoll, he's the minister of the gospel. He's one of my wife's favorite preachers. He's even better than me, if you can believe that. Okay, I'm not in his league, but I'm ready to play if he ever calls me. He is good. He wrote this, and I really love this. It's in my good stuff file. I don't know where that good stuff file is, but I've been trying to find it the last few days, but I do know this one. 
He says it this way. The Greeks had a race in the Olympic Games that was quite unique. The winner was not the runner who finished first. It was the runner who finished with the torch still lit. And he said, I want to run all the way. I want to run all the way with the flame of my torch still lit for him. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The torch is still lit. It's essential that we finish the race but it will be a disaster if we think we somehow sway God in doing it our way. And let me tell you, there are a lot of people that are trying to sway God to doing it their way. And they're teaching it as though it's truth when it's a lie. It boils down to this. If you want to be used by God, and I believe that you do, then you will want to live a godly life before him. Not a check your list so it seems that you got everything checked off because you will never check it all off. You don't need to be perfect to be used by God, and I praise God for that. But you need to be someone who is attempting to live a godly life before him. That's what he's after. In Leviticus, he tells us, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy. He knows we are not perfect, but he sees us as perfect because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Consecrate yourself. Live now a holy life, he is telling us, because he is holy. And the Christian that has not determined to be different than the world will only hinder others from becoming Christians. And I, for one, I get tired, but I get saddened in my heart by other Christians that tell me God is okay with the world's views on such things as same-sex marriage or transgenders and the lifestyles in which they choose. As Christians, we should know better than that. That is why we live. This is what God tells us. We live in the world, but we are not of the lie of the world any longer. And I know when I say those things, there will be people that may watch or listen and they may say, oh, I don't like what he said. The only thing I will tell you, my friend, take it up with God. Because it's the truth of God's word. And that's all he ever asks any of us. Oh, D.L. Moody said it this way, and I like his as well. He says, a holy life will make the deepest impression." Lighthouses blow no horns, they just shine. Torch still lit. We are the God that people see, my friend. We are. We are not to strive. Let me back up, let me back up and say it. We are not striving to reflect Him. If we're not striving to reflect Him. Why in the world would he choose us? Why? If our light reflects the world's view, we are facing in the wrong direction. And so let me end with just this. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him is God sees your heart in this very moment. His eyes are scanning your life like no x-ray, MRI, or CAT scan could ever do. He knows all there is about you. And he's wanting to find a heart that is loyal to him and not to the world any longer. So it comes back to the question, will you be the person he can use only you can answer that question my friend only you but remember that God stands ready to redeem us cleanse us and bless us 
because God is a good God. God is so good. He's so good to me. God answers prayers. He's so good to me. God cares for me. He's so good to me. I love him so. He's so good to me. You need to respond today. You can come forward. I promise you, you won't come alone. Nobody's here to condemn you, but we're here to be for you. We're here for you. You come. It's together. We stand and sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to me. He cares for me. much for coming today we appreciate uh, you coming especially appreciate our visitors and hope you'll be able to come back and and focus on God with us together I have some thank you notes to read today three of them uh, the first one says dear church family thank you so much for the thoughtful plant you sent following my recent knee replacement surgery and especially I appreciate your thoughts prayers and Phone calls that have greatly helped in my road to recovery. Uh, sincerely, uh, Shane McClory. And the second one is goes like this to our church family. Thank you for the lovely plant that you sent to us during Stan's hospital stay. His surgery went well, and he is on his way to recovery. Your prayers and text messages were very much appreciated in Christian love. Stan and Luanna Neely. And one more. A thank you note. It says, Dear Western Hills Church family, thank you for all of the love, cards, really good cookies, and really pretty decorations for my 90th birthday. Uh, being 90 is great. Love, Eugenia Kendall. So very nice thank you notes. Uh, today, I would also like to recognize more of our accomplished youth. Uh, Avery Dowdy and Kate Dennis were on MacArthur High School's homecoming court this past week. Avery is the second from the left and Kate is the third from the, from the right. Congratulations to these young ladies for their beauty inside and out. I know they are great at Christian examples. Harley's lesson today was about if God can use someone like me. Uh, many characters of the uh, Bible doubted themselves, but even so, God used them in great ways. And God does use us to spread his aroma. As an example of that, Harley highlighted it in his lesson today. Um, after Dean's announcement last week, 
about what we gave over $11,000 to hurricane relief. Uh, I want uh, to read something here that kind of emphasizes that. It's from 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. It reads, But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are perishing. Please stand for a closing prayer. Dear Father, may your efforts through us uh, pass on your aroma. We ask for blessings on that special contribution that was made and sent this past week. Father, help us to all go in peace, to love and serve you in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a good week.